today I was just going to run over um, what we're doing at Deakin in terms of this space of integrating storage with uh, description discovery is where I've loosely um, described it. So I'll start the presentation if, if it's going to advance for me. So we've got a fairly loosely coupled ecosystem uh, to handle this at Deakin. Uh, which is great, it's flexible in design, but as I've said there, it's, it, it can for, causes a lot of confusion in practice and the, the, uh, I've had a lot of problem getting researchers engaged with the fabric because it is quite confusing and you'll see with the diagram I'll present a couple of slides later um, what I mean. So just trying to disambiguate some of that and clarify uh, what the, the tools are about and how they can actually assist rather than inhibit um, publishing of data and, and using the storage is really what we're trying, what the focus is on at the moment. So in the describe space, we um, we implemented Redbox Mint under the um, City in the Commons and other ANS funded initiatives and we call that research data footprints to describe the footprint of your research. We've got the discovery layer so that uh, repository um, isn't what we present to the world at large. We feed that into our um, ASHA Funder Research Repository, which is called DRO, Deakin Research Online. And then that's what Research Data Australia harvests for the individual records. And the actual data that may be shared in an open way is made visible through a very simple, uh, very basic portal called the Deakin Data Portal, which is basically just an Apache server on top of the data itself. <coughs> and I'll show demo of all these things later on to expand those, those screenshots. So when we were um, implementing this um, metadata repository, uh, we also implemented a research data storage system which allows researchers to provision storage themselves. We didn't have any strict uh, requirements on that, so anybody can create a bucket to, to store data, um, but it is aligned with that, that data portal when a researcher is ready to, they can publish the data itself and it will link those things together and that's what allows it to be exposed to the data portal. So how does this all fit together? This is the diagram I was talking about just before. So we've got various components and I'm sure most of you would be familiar with some of these systems in play but basically the, um, the management system is the source of truth for project and party data around researchers that feeds this repository I was just talking about. The storage system can be, you, you can create um, storage and choose to link it to a project or not. We're quite flexible with that because we understand that the actual process of um, writing a grant can actually generate a bit of data, so before success outcome, so we didn't want to dissuade people from using the central storage that we've got on offer. Um, and really it was also a, a carrot to stop people buying external hard drives and storing data locally on their machine. So having that <coughs> resilient storage in our data centre was a pretty key um, point for that service. And then the rest of it's pretty pretty um, familiar to most of you. So we mint DOIs against every data set that's created and expose that through to this, this fabric down the bottom. So it is a bit of a, a quagmire and does cause a bit of confusion, but with, with the presentation layer, which is our focus on the moment, it is, it is limited in that it's just a bucket of data and we're just presenting it as a list. And so the, the benefit to the researcher is limited and that's what our focus is on now, is looking at, well, how can we better make people aware of this storage that is available and how it should, is intended to be used and how can we better display some of the, the data that people are generating. Uh, at the moment, um, I'm getting a lot of people creating storage containers or collections and just backing up their whole hard drive to it and there's really no description and delineation to um, what how they're describing things. So it's really identified to me that there's, there's pretty poor practice out there in terms of how people structure what they're doing. And so that's where our library um, staff are helping out a lot in that one-to-one -one or one-to-small group discussions around how better to describe and manage um, data in the in the broader context. Uh, what I was also going to say there is we've got a, um, a portal at Deakin called Deakin Sync and we're looking to um, provide some context um, to what researchers are doing there around storage and so when one of the ideas um, is to link, uh, present to the researcher if they've got a successful grant outcome, pres to, um, present to them the option of creating storage if we know we have, they haven't linked it um, to that project already. 
it's because we've got all that metadata there, we can actually leverage quite a lot. So with that portal, we can provide a lot of value and direct every, all the researchers to go there to say, okay, well, you may want to be creating some records because we can see the project's been running and it's near the end of its life cycle or um, at the earlier stages, can actually create storage to put the data in that you're planning to generate with that project. The other options on the presentation layer we're looking at are discipline specific or quite um, aggregated systems that allow you to display data for various different disciplines. So um, we're only just starting to look at how we can integrate these things into this this platform or this ecosystem. Um, some of those things are like a Mika for all different disciplines that may want to create collections and manage them themselves and use that as their presentation layer rather than just a bucket with a um, an Apache index on top of that. Um, Figshare and MyTardis are bringing around image data, Figshare being quite general and looking at Figshare for institutions and how that could potentially play a part or MediaFlux, we're still really investigating all those different options. So that's the real ecosystem and I didn't want to go into too much um, on that and really wanted to show you how it all sort of functions. This is the Redbox system we have and most people would have seen that um, in the past. It's allowing you to um, create the data descriptions as, as we all are well aware. What I wanted to show you here was um, the, the process we go through for each of these and how the DOIs are, are linked into the actual the data portal side of things. So when the process is they create a metadata record and then when they're ready to publish the data, um, they click a publish in the, in the store, which I'll show you in a minute. And then the links for that come into here um, and it's published, it publishes this data portal link and you may be able to see on the screen the, the URL down the bottom, which keeps those two things in check. And then when you go to view that um, actual data collection, you can then see it on this data portal and which one was that? The interview data for some Papua New Guinea audio interviews. So we replicate the metadata from that footprints record. Um, and actually show the contents here to be able to download if you want to. But it's very, very basic. There's no packaging of that which would be really ideal. Um, there's no thumbnail sort of view of that. So you really you're just downloading in that first example there, 800 megabytes, and then you can actually understand what it's all about. So exporting the metadata of that MPEG file in this case is not really done at this point, and that's where I'm wanting to get some improvements to present that better. Um, the data store is this system here, it's just a, a web application that hooks into our corp, um, corporate storage that we have available. And what we've done is provided um, four collection types and we allow researchers to create those activities, they can link those to a project and then they can create these buckets to store things. So they can create a, a traditional network attached file share which is these little yellow icons and they can create any number of those. There's a no, no, nominal limit of 10, but they can create any, and they are unlimited. They can put as much data in there as they like, and that uses our, um, what technology are we using now? We're using Isilon storage for that, so it means there's snapshots taken three times a day, one, one snapshot at the end of the day for three months, so they've got complete ability to restore files and manage their data very flexibly. Um, there is another one called a publishable file share, so when they're ready to publish data, they can create one of those. It's no different in terms of the technology, but it allows you to hook into the actual um, footprints record and then that little data portal link happens. The other one there with a the little star, this is an icon for a um, product called Simplicity, so we're providing a Dropbox-like service because we need it. There's a lot of researchers working with external parties and they've got a lot of issues sharing data externally. So they can use this service now to, to uh, provide that. So that's using our own on-premise storage with a, a synchronize or sync and share platform on top of that. So it gives them unlimited storage. Although unlimited in the sense that you need the storage on your local computer for that to really function. Um, but it has, has been very, um, it's taken up quite rapidly because people really want that capability without having to pay for a Dropbox account and, and use that storage. And the other collection which I don't have in this demonstration activity here is a wiki space. So we've got a uh, Confluence wiki instance which they can use for collaborative work internally. Um, and so the store, the research data store has really gone from storage as in storing data to actually a store as you buy things. And so that's going to expand. We'll be providing a whole lot of 
other services through this research data store. So blog engines and Amica instances and a whole lot of different things will be provided through this one portal for researchers and it will all be tied together under this, this activity or this project banner. So a particular example I was going to show you is the um, is a Pacific Sea Star. But Mark here has got a, um, some sequence data that he's produced and he wanted to make it open so he's gone ahead and published that. He's um, created the our Fez Fedora ASHA repository record through our footprint system and then he wanted to share that to the world. So originally he, he was working with the library and they um, stored the objects within the repository which wasn't great and so now they're um, provided through the data portal and so you can um, download the gigabytes or megabytes in this case of um, files and one thing I'm advising researchers is to really be descriptive about what that is. I'm sure people in his discipline understand what all those different file formats are but it doesn't really have a overview sort of readme file that could describe it better. So we're working with them on that and uh, that's presented with that hookup through that that link there and also is, is um, a link that's available here so you can actually be taken straight to that record. All the DOI is mapped through to our research repository so Footprints really is just a collection gateway that links those things together um, and allows the, the record to be curated as accurately as possible. So really that's all I was wanting to cover off today. Can Chris talk more about the publishing function? Absolutely. Um, so really it's, it's, we call it publish, but it's, um, it really just formalises the link between the two systems. They create a publishable file share, which is just a, um, a network attached storage location. Everyone should be fairly familiar with network attached storage, it's just a network drive. Um, and so they would just have a folder like this to store things. Let's just say this workshops one, for example, is something they would store. They would structure their data within that space. That's completely offline, it's not exposed to anyone other than themselves. And then when they're ready to publish um, the data, I'll just see if some of the, this is UAT, so the, I might get some errors, but um, when they're ready to publish the data, they can then click a publish button, quite simply. Yes, good, it's ready to go. So this particular folder, which is fictitious because it's UAT, but when they're ready to publish, they literally do that. It will then look at all their footprints records and provide a list of ones that they that haven't been published and they can just choose that. So um, in this example here I've already published against this other one but this one here I could potentially do that. And then I can provide global access so just say yep anyone can get access or I could restrict it to an AF member so in some way you could limit down to anyone who's a member of the AF to who could see that. So it's sort of semi-open in terms of its collection. And then within a few minutes that collection would be exposed through that data portal I showed you before. So you would see um, it would appear here or if I logged in and it was restricted, um, it, there would be more exposed once I'm logged into the system. So anyone in Australia can log into this, this data portal as you can see and um, then see that. So that's how that, that's, that's working. All right, Chris, there's a whole bunch of other questions that are coming in as you do that. Um, and says, what's the maximum storage space a researcher can request? Is there a maximum, did you say? Yes, what is the maximum? None, it's unlimited. Oh, I'm sure they'll all so, like that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our uh, IT are uh, uh, managing the growth and um, capital acquisition that has to happen and um, they deal with that as it goes. So yes, it's completely unlimited. Um, so this okay. next question probably ties into that, which says, what's the cost of the implementation of what you have at Deacon, particularly the data storage costs? So there's no explicit cost. It's covered under our um, central central capital expenditure on storage. So it's just factored into all the storage that the university buys. So there hasn't been an explicit cost for this particular service. At the moment, there's just about, um, what are we up to, 100 terabytes with another... Um, 60 at another site, so nearly 200 terabytes is what we're looking at, so not overly large. We don't have any astrophysicists with a petabyte in their back pocket. So um, it's, it's probably relatively small to most institutions, but it is, it's covered under that. So they, they provision that under systematic um, procurement throughout the year.
So every time they're, they're always negotiating a new price for that storage. So I don't have to worry about that, which is actually a luxurious position to be in. Mm -hmm. um, so probably that ties into that is a couple of questions which sort of meld together. <clears throat> One that says, use of storage by external to deepen users, most collaborations are now national or international, so is this possible so that the external to deepen users can use it? And there's another question very similar which says, is this service going to be available for researchers in other universities and is there storage size limitations for them? So the first bit um, is covered under that sync and share service um, where they can they can provision it, so a deacon identity can provision it and share that with colleagues they're working with at other institutions. Um, which, but there are limits to that because if you're synchronising to your own computer, you need the hard drive storage on your own computer, so there are limits. The traditional network attached storage, any deacon identity can access that because they can create a VPN connection, but the external people can't. So the way that's traditionally been handled at deacon is uh, we often make those collaborators um, we need it as a visitor to the university and then they get access to the to the storage. So it's a little bit cumbersome and I don't, it, 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 but, but most people know how to work around that and, and follow that process. Um, and the last question, no, there wouldn't be the ability for non-deacon people to create the storage space in the first place. It really has to be instigated from deacon's perspective. Okay. Um, another one is, are the researchers able to mint DOIs by this publishing method? Yeah, so in the um, footprints system, that's where the DOI is minted, uh, they are done by the library. So the library, when they're performing quality checks on the description, are performing the step of minting it. So it's done implicitly in that the workflow of a, a metadata record is curated by the library and they're the ones actually doing that, but it's a, a, effectively it's a business to business transaction that happens on every one of those records. So, um, yeah, the okay. research themselves don't, but the library does it on their behalf. Okay, and then probably the last one, so we can keep to Paul's time, it says, is the, all the data stored on Deacon infrastructure or is it stored on national infrastructure, e.g. RDS or local e-research yeah. provider? So, yes, it is all on Deacon infrastructure. So. Um, Amongst our four main campuses, we've got two data centres, and the, it's stored on the the data the, within those data centres and replicated on those two. So we haven't engaged with the um, the RDSI provision storage. Um, it's all purely within on premise, which our researchers like because it means they can, particularly if it's sensitive data, they can tick a lot of boxes in terms of their compliance that they need to ensure. Fantastic. 